So reading this book, uh, just a really great foundation in yeah. in zoology and just in the different, you know, how evolution works and how evolutionary biologists think about different forms of 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 life. And yeah. the thing and the the really interesting idea that I took away from it was that you know, we imagine, and it's going to sort of feed into the conversation we're about to have today, and maybe I'm just going to say this again twice, but that we we imagine life, like we only have a sample size of one. We have the earth. Right. But the reality is, is that life has, has accomplished the same thing many times. It has, you know, has developed the eye. It has developed yes. flight. It has developed... Um, uh, you know, different kinds of you know, exoskeleton or skeleton. In, the the and, shape of the crab has emerged five different times yeah, in evolution. Yeah, yeah, and so and so what that tells you is that in fact we we're almost guaranteed to find crabs on alien worlds. Like it's like, and eyeballs. Yeah, eyeball alien crabs with eyeballs with flying things above them. And and that because as long as you've got gravity and liquid and variations in height and tides and different amounts of sunlight, you're yeah. going to have different amounts of um, of you're going to have similarities just appear. And it's only until you get something that's going to be dramatically different uh Linda Sadiq was asking about the book. I did an interview yesterday on my YouTube channel with Wallace Arthur on the biological universe. Um, yeah, like it's only when you see a dramatically different environment will we see things that are different from what we have here on Earth. Right. And and that was what I found really, uh, really interesting just to just to hear how evolution converges on on the same solution using different um just different strategies well and i honestly think that worlds with similar geologies will form similar solutions but as we go to stranger and stranger geologies and atmospheric conditions that's when we're start we're going to start to see radically different things emerging yeah yeah and we're learning that geology is hugely varied because stars put planets in different places. They mm -hmm. have different temperatures, different tidally locked or not tidally locked conditions. So there's every possible niche out there waiting to be filled. Yeah. 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 And, it, and so it's like what I'm most excited about in exoplanets is stuff that's weird. Yes. Stuff that's stuff that we don't have in the solar system and yet is still theoretically habitable, like yeah. uh, an ocean world, which has water that is many kilometers deep across the entire surface. And so you just like, look, what does that mean? Like, what is what is the top predator in an environment that has no land? Right. And I just want to, like, understand how different the ocean flows would be without land to moderate the tides yeah. and the do you get differential rotation so that the the oceans are flowing differently around the world like yeah. we see with sunspots on yeah. the sun or, or all or, of that will affect life or like what about a a world that is tidally locked and so the sun never goes down what is it what is a tree how does a tree behave when the sun never goes down and it's just constant in an extraordinarily sunlight. high wind environment. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And so it's <laughs> exactly. And so you get these combinations which push beyond any of the environments that we have here on Earth. That's right. when we'll start to see brand new forms of life, while we will see things that will look very familiar if we see the planets are very familiar. Yeah, it'll feel like no man's sky. That's the uh, people who people look like, everywhere you go. No man's sky kind of looks the same. All right. Um, it's uh, it's wide but shallow. Uh, actually, it's way better. They've, they've improved No Man's Sky significantly. It's a much better game than it used to be. Um, okay, I'm going to say hi to some people. Okay. Hello to Andrew Planet, Briastro, Brian Cordova, Camaral, Chad Weber. Hmm. Don't you have work to hi, do, Chad, Chad Weber? 
Cherry, Corey S., Douglas Clausen, DPI 209, Elit Avron, Esther Gagne, Gordon Dewis, Guido Bibra, Harry Patrick, Ian Farkron, Jay Alexanderson, Jason Elric, uh, John Suffield, Katrina Astro YYZ, Larry Beckham, Larry King, Linda Sadiq, Luke Duke, Magnus, Mrs. Nett, Nancy Graziano, Noel Ruppenthal, Paul Gracie, Priyanka Lamachain, Rich Wilson, Tesla Ranger, Thomas Draniker, Zach Perry, and Zafan Zafan. Hey, everybody. Welcome. And we have a much smaller audience over on Twitch, which just now caught up with us. So I want to say hi to Ms. Brick Kitten, to DPA209, to Planetary Pan, to Inane English, and to Buck Hoffel. Right on. Welcome, everybody. So if you're wondering what it is that you've stumbled into, we are about to record a live episode of our long-running, much-beloved show, Astronomy Cast, uh, where we talk about space and or astronomy. Um, oh, there you go. Chad was testing on a live video. Oh, are you trying to test to see if you can keep up with us on the graphics, Chad? Did you want to join the video? Or is that too much pressure? Um, so yesterday, Chad and I are trying to figure out a new way for him to engineer a video live. So I'm doing answering questions. He has no idea what I'm answering questions about. And yet he's digging up graphics and video and pictures to go along with what I'm talking about. That's the plan. Okay, Chad, reach out to me because this is sort of what we do with our community coffee and daily space over on Cosmic Quest. I know your pain. We have some ways to make it hurt okay. less. Okay. Yeah. He, see, he, he's got thousands of videos all nicely tagged in his video editing software. And so he can quickly search for stuff and be able to display it. But it turns out it just, uh, it was more complicated than we thought, which is, you know, how it works. But no, no, he's actually got it right. He's got a tagging system. So, so what Chad is working on right now is a tool that lets us um, siphon in comments on the live streams and then be able to do okay. work with them so we can highlight them put them into a database answer them later be able to show them on the screen things like that so it's very helpful that your video editor is also a computer programmer yes it's very convenient yes. to have both of those hand in hand all right uh so no chad will not be joining us today um <laughs> there you go chad says he'll definitely want to talk to you about it Zach Perry saying it kind of worked though. Yeah, it kind of worked, but not not as I think both both Chad and I figured out it could be it could work out better. So that we'll 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 solve this. Don't you worry. All right. Um are you ready to go? I I think so. Um I need to close some things that are going bing in my ear. Bing. Bing. I was mentioning on the Weekly Space Hangout, I, I uh, dropped the hammer and purchased a new uh, MacBook Air. One of us. Mm, I don't like it. You're going to need to get loot back. I'm not going to use it for anything but just just to... Oh, playing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just walk, I'm walking around machine. I'm not going okay. away from my windows. I'm not, I'm not buying into the ecosystem. I was mentioning on the show, you know, I'm just going to take the thing, I'm going to put it in a Ziploc bag, and I'm going to leave it outside because I don't even want it stinking up the house. <laughs> All right. Me and my Mac ecosystem yeah. Yeah. are ready to plus record whenever okay. you are. Yeah, sure. Let's find out if it works. All right. Pressing record. Oh, what's the episode number today? Uh, this is episode 586. Okay. Pressing record and being prompted for a file name so it can auto save. I press All right, record. I am recording. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 586 Life as We Know It Habitable Exoplanets and Extremophiles. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I am doing well. Good. I am doing well. We determined yesterday that North America is filled with hobbit seas because Canada has first Thanksgiving in October mm -hmm. and we have second Thanksgiving right. here 
in America right. or United States. So, um, yes, I enjoyed second Thanksgiving yesterday. I, I've made the case in the past. I really think that folks in the U.S. should adopt the Canadian Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, the weather is better, so the travel is easier. Uh, it's just all around a better time of year to, to hold, to attempt to bring an entire family together to one location. I just, just take it under advisement. This year, I'm okay with having as many barriers as possible to prevent people from getting together. But right. in future years, I'll, I'll consider your offer. So before we get going on this week's episode, I want to let people know that I've made a, a slight change to what I do with Universe Today and the newsletter. So for people who may or may not know, I let anyone use content on Universe Today for any reason whatsoever. So if you want to take our article and republish it on your website, be our guest. If you want to use it on your newsletter, go ahead. If you want to use it for the script of your radio play, you have my permission. Only the words, not the pictures. We don't own those. We own the words. We don't own the pictures. Um, but I put the, uh, the Creative Commons license on every page on Universe Today, as well as the newsletter, just to make it really super clear that you have our permission to use our content. And so, so when you see my articles stolen on some other website, it was, it's not possible to steal my articles. It is, it is, and that is a huge thank you to, especially to the patrons who yeah. I'm, I'm able to then pay for the, pay for the writers. And, you know, the writers are all understand that this is the way this rolls. And all we ask is that if you are going to use our content, that you give a link back to the original source, but most importantly, um, show who wrote the article in the first place. Like in this modern age, the only thing that we can really rely on is our personal reputation. And one of the things that I really want to do with Universe Today is help writers build a name for themselves and a reputation in an industry that really doesn't have a lot of job security, even from me. So <laughs> I'll pay them for now, but also I would love it that they can have build a name for themselves so that in the future they can, they can use that as their portfolio. And so if you take their article and you don't give them credit, then you're stealing their future. Yeah. And, and we release everything here on astronomy cast and cosmic yeah. quest the exact same way. We really believe in basically open licensing, get the information yeah. out there and promote the people creating the information. Exactly. So there you and go. if you create something really cool, make sure you get our attention so that we can see it and we'll lift up yeah. what you do as yeah. well. So in the past, I've guaranteed you will never get a copyright infringement message from me. Now my I am legally bound to not be able to send a copyright infringement to you. So, all right, let's get into this week's episode. As scientists continue to explore the Earth, they're discovering life, surviving, and even thriving in the most extreme environments. What hints can get, what hints can this give us about what we might find as we search for life on other worlds? I'm going to record the whole thing again. Hold on a second. Fair. All right, here we go. As signed, <clears throat> and now I'm going to not choke. I'm going to have a little sip of water. Sorry, Richard. Okay. As scientists continue to explore the Earth, they're discovering life, surviving, and even thriving in extreme environments. What hints can this give us about what we might find as we search for life on other worlds? All right. Uh, this is, of course, one of our favorite topics. Uh, life in the universe, where is it? Uh, isn't it funny that people always accuse us of like being part of the vast conspiracy that's hiding the search for life? in the universe and it's literally like most of what we talk about like, where's it we want there to be life humans yeah we want it to be out there this is our deep sea i'm a sci-fi lover i really am let let's go meet those aliens the small ones that can't <laughs> hurt us right. um but first of all you can't trust a scientist with a secret most of the time because we get too excited about yeah. what we do and we periodically drink alcohol and yeah, yeah you can't trust us it's like that you know that discovery of phosphine on venus like it was the worst kept secret in all of space and astronomy 
Like we all knew what was coming, uh, even though it was all under embargo. Yes. Not a secret. But anyway, that's uh, you know we're we're kind of rabbit holing as as we do. So let's talk about about the. I don't know, I feel like it's like, you know, I always use this term golden age, but it, once again, weirdly, we're in this golden age of astrobiology, and yet astrobiology has not done the one thing that it's supposed to do. I, I'd say renaissance. We're renaissance? at that point sure. where we're coming out of the dark ages of everyone being told, you can't talk about this, you can't think about this, we won't fund this, to the... We're going to go looking for it. Let's everybody think right. about it. Let's everyone. It's it's a renaissance yeah. of astrobiology. And in part, it's it's driven twofold by the realization there's water on Mars. It's briny, but it's there. Yep. And the realization that you can't dig, burrow, dive, or travel anywhere on our world and not find some sort of life there. So you've got this confluence. On the one hand, you've got life reaching into every nook and cranny of the entire planet, pretty much no matter how extreme it can be. And then on the other hand, you've got those conditions starting to show up on other worlds in the solar system. And, and so as we start finding life in the weirdest of weird places, we find it harder and harder to imagine that life hasn't come to find a way to fill all the super weird places in other worlds. What's what's your favorite form of extreme life? Sure. So, uh, well, I mean, there's a couple, um, but the, I mean, I, obviously everyone wants, wants to talk about tardigrades, but the one that I like are the pompy worms, which are the, so at the bottom of the, of the ocean, you've got the, the hydrothermal vents that are blowing water out into the bottom of the ocean. And they can range in temperature from like 30 Celsius up to about 200 Celsius. And so you get these worms, the Pompey worms, which will, will, which build these tubes that attach to the hottest, the black smokers. And at the bottom of the worm's tunnel, it's about 150 to 200 Celsius. And then at the top of the worm, it's about 50 Celsius. And so the worm can handle this change in temperature from its, its entire body has adapted to handle this change in temperature from the right where the water is pouring out of the out of the black smoker to the top where it's mixing with the colder seawater. And it, you know, it keeps its face side up and keeps its butt side down. Um, but it's an animal, like it's not just like a cyanobacteria, yeah. it's an animal that is able to handle just a ridiculous environment. There you go. That's my favorite. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that is a thing. Um, so, so for me, it's the life that they're finding two miles under the surface of the earth as folks go digging for gold in Africa. They have found down in some of the South African mines, uh, crustaceans, flatworms, <laughs> random arthropods, just hanging out two miles beneath the surface. No light, just termites. That's one of the things they found down there. And the termites, idea that you can have- Miles this down. You can have an entire ecosystem two miles under the earth in the soil. It's just absolutely amazing. That's incredible. Um, and yeah. not to mention, you've got the um, like the life forms like cyanobacteria and various kinds of fungi. And of course, the tardigrades, which recently yes. were sent to the International Space Station. They opened up the 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 pod bay doors and they kicked those uh life forms out into space uh like like someone was playing um among us and yes. a year later they brought them back in and checked them out and many of them not only survived but thrived the the only thing that has been found to readily kill tardigrades is google phones 
There was an experiment a few years ago where Google was working on a phone that had a modular design and you could buy different modules to put together to build the phone of your choice. And one of the modules they had available had a little tiny digital microscope and tardigrades. And this really bright light came on whenever you wanted to see your tardigrades and it was discovered that the rapid desiccation that these critters went through trying to escape the light would kill them so um expose them to space expose them to what you will they will live just don't put them in your cell phone <laughs> right so so let's talk about then at, at this point based on the the current thinking from astrobiologists how far like how extreme is life here on earth you know where can you be sure to find it from from region to region so you can find it out to temperatures as high as 200 degrees celsius right. which is one that broke my brain yeah you can find it as cold as minus 25 degrees celsius oh. you can find it at ph's greater than 11 you can find it at pH is as low as uh, negative 0 0.06, which is not something I knew the pH scale did, but apparently it does. It goes into, uh, this is into negative numbers. In some of the acidic mine drainage and volcanic springs, basically the scale gets broken. <laughs> it's like the uh, the magnitude scale for, for stars. Um, you, you can find it... Uh, basically in high pressure environments where the pressures are 1,100 bars, not millibars, bars, pressure down in the depths of the Mariana Trench. You can find it in highly salinic environments, which is part of what gives us hope for Mars. So, so here they're finding basically put as much salt as you can into water until it's super suspended in the water, super saturated solution, and you can still find life. And then you find things at highly uh, dry environments out in the Atacama Desert, in the McMurda Dry Valleys of Antarctica. And then, as I said, um, deep in the crust of the Earth, we also have radiation uh, eating bacteria that have been discovered uh, with nuclear power plants. Um, and then there's all the life that is just happily living in the hot acidic springs, happy as happy can be with the high metallicities. So like cadmium, cobalt, all these things that would happily kill most life. There's still an extremophile capable of being happy right. with all those metals. And that's just on the surface of the planet. You can go up into the atmosphere, pretty much to the ozone layer, and find bacteria and other animals suspended, flying around happily in the atmosphere. Uh, really, it's just like as soon as you get above the ozone layer and the radiation is too intense, that's where it stops. And Crazy. that's pretty much what it takes. Um, yeah. So then yeah. let's take that. So, so now that we've like know that life can handle all of these extremes, let's map that to, to some of the places in the solar system where we think we might be able to find similar environments. So Mars is the low hanging fruit. This is a world that we know has water. We believe it has liquid water that's extremely salty. This is a brine that could exist um, below the surface. There are caves, lava tubes, other geologic features that can protect life from the, well, radiation if it needs to be protected from the radiation of space. Um, so it's quite possible that there is cave life on Mars, subsoil life on Mars. Um, we don't imagine it's big. This could be a lack of imagination on our own part, given what's found in gold mines. Mm -hmm. But currently, it's perfectly reasonable to imagine that there's bacterial life there. Like, unless there's something really surprising, you could take a scoop of this briny material underneath the surface of Mars, pour it here on Earth, 
and it would, you know, give it sunlight and or some form of energy, and it would probably quickly be colonized by some form of life from Earth. And rather than doing that and potentially committing genocide of some perfectly happy microorganism, I'd much rather take an actually functioning version of the mole on insight that has a microscope and light source and let it dig and look around and see what it's capable of finding. You just have to be able to get down a couple of kilometers below the regolith on Mars, which is not going to be easy. Well, it's unclear that you have to get that deep down before you start finding liquid water beneath the surface. So if it's just a few meters down, things are going to be really different. Um, but that's Mars, which is a fairly inhospitable place that doesn't have a real atmosphere, that doesn't have vast amounts of subsurface water that isn't trapped in minerals or frozen. It appears to have a lot of subsurface glaciers, potentially. But while life is found in desiccated ice, um, it's not the easiest environment. Yep. If you want an easier environment, there's the worlds of Titan and Europa. And with Europa, we have a icy shell that is perhaps only a couple of kilometers thick in a few places and then reaches down to huge depths and perhaps has its own forms of the Mariana Trench, these places that have smokers, mm -hmm. that have geological heat sources down beneath. And there's some amazing artwork that has been done and even used by NASA showing sea cucumbers and other multicellular organisms that are complex living in that watery environment. We can imagine these things. Mm -hmm. We don't know if they're there, but we can imagine them. And that's and and that's I mean awesome. and that's even a more direct comparison that there is absolutely places on Earth that are environments that are very similar to that. And yeah. and Earth life forms would be glad to inhabit those kinds of landscapes. Um, now you mentioned you mentioned Europa, and of course, there's also Enceladus, but you mentioned Titan. I mean, Titan is like Europa, but it's got like an extra um, quirk, which is that it's got all these hydrocarbons on its surface to add to the complexity of it. So so Titan is a giant moon of Saturn. It's surrounded by a rich methane atmosphere. It has liquid ethane and methane forming lakes on its surface. It's at this combination of temperature and gravity that allows that methane ethane to have a water cycle just like water has here on Earth, showing that triple point of being able to exist as a gas, as a liquid, and as a solid. Now, with that triple point of methane creating a methane cycle within the atmosphere, you have to start thinking about methanogens, a form of life that once occupied our own planet in vast amounts. And it has a different metabolism. It's not out there looking for oxygen like we are. And that may make it possible for methanogens to exist. And there's been some evidence that the chemistry of the atmosphere of Titan isn't balanced out in a way that we can necessarily explain well. It doesn't appear to be in chemical equilibrium. So as with so many worlds in our solar system, we find ourselves saying things like, there's either some geological process going on that we don't know about, which I can guarantee that is happening, <laughs> or there is life, or both, there is a geological process we don't understand, right. and there is life. Now, we're, I mean, this is us talking about Earth-based extremophiles, worth it, life as we know it, and then yeah. finding that in other places. And so there could be an entirely different kind of ecosystem on Titan that is using a different kind of liquid 
solution for the chemicals to be able to mix around with, you know, the solvent here on Earth is water. And that's why we're always looking for water. There right. could be all manner of different life as we don't understand it flavors out there, which is totally different. But um, but even in in its current situation, because Titan has this vast water ocean underneath, because it has all the chemicals for life on the surface, there could be some kind of mixing that's going on from surface to to under the ice. And that's and, exciting. And this is where it gets so frustrating that we have the technological abilities to start going and looking, but it's extraordinarily expensive and also extraordinarily hazardous to any potential life that might be out there. So we want to go looking, but at the same time, the more things we try and land on Titan, the more likely we are to carry our own life there and accidentally set off some sort of a genocide that we never intended. Yeah, and 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 I guess that's why these experiments where people are are spacing uh, various extremophiles to find out how they handle it and finding that they're doing just fine. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Is showing us that earth life is far more resilient than anyone really ever gave it, gave it credit for. And that uh, we do have to be careful when we start to explore these other worlds that we're not, and we've joked about this in the past, right? That every, every time you just like take a sample of the water, you're like, huh, more cyanobacteria and, and, uh, and water bears. That's weird. Tardigrades, yeah. tardigrades and cyanobacteria everywhere we look across the solar system. I wonder how they got there. You know, it's like it's like V'ger. Keep your tardigrades to yourself, yeah. people. Keep, keep your yeah. tardigrades to yeah. yourself. So we've talked about we've talked about like the watery environments on Mars. We've talked about the ocean worlds of Enceladus, Titan, Europa, and in fact, like probably all of them: Ganymede, Callisto, Pluto, even maybe. Um, so let's talk about Venus as a place for extremophiles. And and we are still waiting for final word on was the phosphine de detection solid or not. Um, so, so we understand, do not add us, that Venus may or may not actually have phosphine detected in its atmosphere. So it is possible that in the convective circulation of droplets in the atmosphere of Venus, you can end up with a life cycle such that droplets that seed around small haze particles, those haze particles might be spores. And as the particles form around as, sorry, as the droplets form around this haze, the drops can get lofted up into the atmosphere, gathering more and moisture around them as they do, and creating larger and larger droplets that sometimes collide, allowing different spores from different droplets to interact as they become life forms rather than just desiccated spores, capable perhaps of reproduction, of exchanging genetic material, and eventually, as this material lofts up, well, the cycle brings it back down, causing it to desiccate back out and rejoin that haze layer. Now, in this kind of a life cycle, the life is airborne its entire existence. It's small, it's confined to temporary drops. But this isn't something unfamiliar to us. While we don't normally look for life cycles of desiccation and rehydration in our own atmosphere, we do see it in deserts where there's life forms that completely desiccate out. Things as complicated as frogs that then as soon as it rains will reemerge, will go through their life cycle in rapid fire, having tadpoles and puddles and then desiccate back out again. That's amazing. Life finds a way. Yeah. Now we've talked about the, the environments that we know of here in the solar system. What are some extreme environments that that we don't have, but other worlds around potentially the Milky Way? Well, one of the most exciting results for me, although I don't think I really realized it in the moment that came out of the AAS meeting we were at in Hawaii last year, was the realization that tightly locked worlds are capable 
of having habitable atmospheres mm -hmm. where it yeah. is possible that there are places in that amazing windstorm that water can exist at the surface that temperatures can be reasonable yeah it's it's funny i did a did an interview last year with someone who works on this and sort of having this conversation and you know the expectation is the front the side that is tidally locked is going to be completely bone dry incredibly hot and then on the back side of the planet it's going to be completely dark and totally frozen and the only place it would be mildly habitable would be just this edge around the the, the twilight zone of the of the planet and the re researcher said no no it's the whole planet facing side because of the air circulation the winds it's redistributing the the heat away from the from the front side it would be like a jungle on the one side of the planet that where the sun never goes down and with high winds. Yeah. So there you have basically a requirement that everything acts more like a willow tree. It needs to bend and be able to sustain the constant storms, but that that's not something we're used to, but it's something that's possible. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's lived in Chicago understands what this feels like. Oh, so maybe it's maybe it's not just possible, but it's like Chicago. But warm. Yeah, exactly. Jungle Chicago. Um, but then another possibility is worlds that are all water. Or at least are, you know, they have oceans that are hundreds of kilometers deep and no land whatsoever. And and this is actually fairly easy to understand and has been the the imaginings of science fiction writers. I just finished reading the book Space Opera, which is a delightful romp and I highly recommend. And one of the things that just kind of gets commented on in passing is life from watery worlds has it so much harder becoming spacefaring, not just because, well, when you live underwater, it's harder to see the stars, but when we fly into space, we have to carry our atmosphere with us. Now imagine that we were dolphins and had to carry all of our water with us as well. Yeah. So that becomes much harder to right. do. So those worlds may not be as spacefaring as we might wish. And even not as nutrient rich because right. because you may not be able to have a way that the that the telluric layer, the 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 mineral layer can interact with the water layer. That the that as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, the pressures of the water get higher and higher and hotter and hotter that it turns into sludge it turns into this high pressure gloop that then you don't get this nice mixing with the with the minerals down at the bottom of the ocean and so it could it could exist but it might actually be very difficult to get that life going it it all depends on what the topography is and what the situation for volcanic vents is as long as you have volcanic vents that are outgassing and oozing and spitting out metals you're in a better position but if you have a geologically quieter world, it's going to be a hard go. Yeah, yeah. And so too much water is is a bad thing. Uh, ab absolutely fascinating. And and I, it's exciting that we've got all these worlds to practice on here in the yeah. solar system before we can then start to turn our telescopes on other worlds around the Milky Way and try to uh, see what's out there. Uh, yeah, incredible. Um, all right. Pamela, thank you so much. Do you have some names for us this week? I do. And this Thanksgiving week, I have to admit, it hit me particularly hard. Just how amazing it is to have all of you out there. Right now in the United States, they're estimating that something like 40% of the people in our country are having food scarcity issues where they oh. don't know where all their meals are coming from. And I realized that because of everything you people out there do to support us, we're paying Richard. We're supporting all of our staff at CosmoQuest, Aviva, Beth, Ali, Annie. We have Fraser's able to support his amazing staff of young science writers and Chad and everything you do. You are actually making it possible for people to know where their next meal's coming mm -hmm. from, know they can pay their bills. And we're able to get through these crazy times because of your donations. Yeah. And like, just a reminder, neither of us take a salary from Astronomy Cast. 
We don't get paid for this. We do yeah. this to because we because we'd probably just be yapping about space and astronomy yes. to anybody who'd listen. Uh, but we and we do this to communicate and to share this information, but also to try to give people work. And there's not a lot of jobs for science writers right now. So thank you for allowing us to science and to support a bunch of people who help us science. So I would like to thank this week. I wish I could go through it and like thank all the hundreds and hundreds of you, but I don't have time for yeah. that. So I'm going to thank Dean, Nalia, Sean Freeman, who's Blixa the Cat, Bart Flaherty, Gabriel Galfin, Sean Humber, Ryan James, the Air Major, Niall Bruce, Kimberly... Uh, sorry, I scrolled. Kimberly Rick, Froda Tenabau, Alex Rain, Justin Proctor, Daniel Loosely, Neuterdu, Joe Wilkinson, Claudia Mastriani, uh, Iran Segev, Matthew Horstman, Thomas Taubau, Kensia Penflienko, David Gates, Paul L. Hayden, Omar Del Riviero, Jean-Francois Roger, uh, Arthur Latz Hall, Mark Grundy, William Lauer, J. Alex Alexanderson, Mark Stephen Raznak, Jeremy Kerwin, Brent Krenop, Bruno Latz, Tim Garish, John, just John, uh, Michelle Cullen, Brian Kilby, Marco Arasi, Dustin Ralph, Martin Dawson, Rachel Fry, Abraham Cottrell, oh. and Anthony Burgess. Okay, we have now thanked everyone who needed to be thanked in November on the last Friday of November. That's why there were so many names. Thank, thank you, all of you. Thank you, everybody. And we will see all of you. We've got four episodes coming up on lunar exploration. So buckle up. It's going to be, uh, a, if you're excited about the moon, we're going to cover it from, from north to south pole. All and right. what's awesome is there may be a starship hop while we're talking about it. Next week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Unless they cut into our ratings. Okay. See everyone next week. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. And now we save. So, like I said, this is 586. Yep. And I'm going to save it in the correct folder this week. I periodically screw up and save either daily space in the astronomy cast folder or astronomy cast in the daily space folder yeah. and get very confused and sad editors. Yeah. Richard usually, I make this mistake too. Richard usually catches it pretty quick. All right. Uh, let's tackle some questions about space and astronomy. Uh, time of dying double O asks, where would life be on IO? IO? Well, uh, like Yosemite, it could be in, uh, hydrothermal pools, if there's any on the surface of Io. We don't know anything other than lava, though. Um, but it's not like the whole planet is covered in, in lava. It's got it's got volcanoes, it's the most volcanically active place in the solar yeah, system, yeah. and it's got lots of lava flows. But I wonder if you could have trapped water underneath that is then heated by the lava, but also is... is cooled by I need the to talk to Loki to Volcano about this. Yeah. So Julie Rathbun, who goes by Loki Volcano on Twitter, she would know this. And of course, NASA was is considering a mission to Io. Yeah. So they uh, up until, uh, uh, you know, three months ago, you know, there was two missions to Venus, a mission to Neptune's moon, Triton, and a mission to Io. And, and people are like, ooh, Io and Triton, that sounds great. And then Phosphine, everyone's like, Venus! <laughs> oh. um, John Suffolk asks, life in the upper cloud layers of Jupiter. That was a favorite of Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, I, I don't know because of the thermodynamics. It just seems really cold. Well, the, it, I mean, the thing is, is that, that Jupiter is made of hydrogen and helium. So it's hard to imagine something that could remain aloft in the lightest element in the universe. Like the only well, thing there that's is lighter water vapor. 
So, so those white clouds, those are actually water vapor. So yeah. by percentage, it's extreme, extremely scarce for that world. Right. But there is the, the trace amounts of methane, of water vapor. And what I don't know is what the place-to-place -place concentration variation is. Yeah. But there's a lot of questions we can't answer this one. Right. But I kind of, you know, I'm just imagining that the only thing that's lighter than hydrogen is, is heated hydrogen. Yeah, so you would have to have true. some sort of creature that that had a sack containing hydrogen that it was warming up. Uh, it would be a tricky, it would be a big lift because otherwise it's just going to drift and it'll stay in the winds for as long as it does. And then it'll, it'll by accident get into the lower levels and then get gobbled up by, by Jupiter. So, um, hit us with some other questions if you've got them. Oh, Explore Scientific is saying hello over on Twitch. Hello, Explore Scientific. Hello, Twitch. The telescope manufacturer? Yeah. That's yeah. my telescope behind me right there. It's an Explore Scientific. Mine is above my head. <laughs> it's There's no reason to store a telescope in a basement, and I am in a basement. Yeah. Store your telescopes near doors, people. I am in a basement, Store your too. telescope yeah. near doors. I, I I feel sad that I don't take this telescope out as much as I could because, one, I live on the west coast of, of Canada, and so we just – the sun leaves us in September, and it returns in April. Um and and as with it the dark the clear skies but also thanks to opt i have access to a amazing telescope in the california desert that i can just use from my computer but um yeah so i'm not it's possible there's dust actually i i put a a, a much better eyepiece and i put a i put a bunch of stuff to for to aid visual observing on the telescope Mm -hmm. And that's been a lot of fun. So I've actually like with Mars and stuff. I bought a Barlow. I bought a um, I bought a, a an eyepiece like an, an adapting eyepiece. It'll change from from four millimeters to twelve millimeters, I think, or twenty millimeters. And so it was it was perfect to be able to look at Mars, look at Saturn, look at the Moon, things like that. I'm a crazy person. I'm just happy with like my 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter plossils most of the time. Yeah. Um, that's the one that's cheap, on my scope simple. right now is my, is my 20 millimeter plot, you know, two inch. They plossel. give a great field of yeah. view. Yeah. You just fall into the sky. It's so good. Um, <laughs> Travis Porco asks, if two supermassive black holes merged into the center of the galaxy, would the gravitational waves be like a fist of God for the galaxy? No. Okay, so uh, Amidis over on Twitch is saying, no more Arecibo replacement options. Dude, well, I just, we just got a question from <sighs> Travis Porco. I, that's what I was saying, gravitational waves. So hold on, we'll get to your question in one second. Okay. If, if, I thought you had said no. I thought I thought no, you I didn't say no. The oh, fine. I can say that. No, no, no. <laughs> if 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 two black holes merged at the center of the Milky Way, we wouldn't even notice. Right. We would be able to notice with LIGO, and that's it. So it's true. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so <laughs> Amidis is saying no more Arecibo replacement options, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's she's dead, Jim. Yes. Um. NSF has been looking to decommission that telescope for years, and yeah. the the amount of money that goes into maintaining facilities. Um, so, so here's the fundamental problem: the amount of money that goes to science in the United States is being held flat. The cost of running a facility is going up with inflation or faster. Yeah. The weather that is hitting these places is getting worse and worse, causing greater damage, which means the amount of money left at the end of the day, once you've paid for all of the facilities, doesn't allow for a whole lot of science anymore. And yeah, if Arecibo magically tomorrow was completely fixed, good as new, it might still get canceled. Yeah. That's that's how little um, that observatory plays into 
science plans that every, you know, we have been reporting, we've been talking about Arecibo getting defunded and getting decommissioned for a decade now. And it always gets this last minute reprieve, and then it gets potentially dismantled again. So the fact that now it's broken, it's gone. And I, like, I hate to say, and and it's a wonderful observatory and, and what it does in terms of its ability to use radar to bounce off of asteroids is incredible. It's right. And, and third rock astronomy is pointing out that there's periodically people saying that we should put a new radio dish on the backside of the moon where it's away from the radio signals here on the earth. And you don't have to worry about your microwaves and things like that. Um, But because the moon rotates so much slower than the Earth, it would give us a much more limited view of the sky and wouldn't have the ability to do all the amazing radar work that Arecibo does simply because we don't have a way to get that kind of power generation on the moon right now. Yeah. I mean, it is ludicrous to, to, um, like honestly think that that's possible in any time in the near future. Yeah. Like right now we cannot even get something back from the moon. The Chinese are doing it. Chinese are doing it right now. I was going to say. Yep. But, but <laughs> Give nobody, it a couple weeks. But nobody else in 40 years has taken more than has, – has even grabbed a handful of dirt from the surface right. of the moon and brought it back to the earth. Um, so yeah, you, you could put a gigantic rotating telescope or a beautiful, like there's, there's a wonderful mission that I really loved where you have this lander land on the moon and then it has this little rover that, that, that lays out a linear antenna across the surface of the moon, like a big flower petal. And it would, it would allow you to do some incredible work. So there, there are some pretty great, relatively inexpensive ideas to, to do this, but I think they're going to be very, they're going to be very specific. They're not going to be these general all purpose, incredible observatories, things like Arecibo that we've got, uh, here on, here on earth. There's just, it's just so hard to do anything on the moon. Right. And even if we have a base on the moon, it's on the, it's going to be on the far side of the moon. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and and the cost of building a new Arecibo, which is getting pointed out by Planetary Pan, is about 80 million here on the surface of the Earth. We we can't (laughs) even get near that price for the far side of the moon. And if 80 million is too expensive to build a new one on Earth, we're not building it on the moon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be. You're exactly right. Like 80 million, 100 million to to give it a complete refresh. Yeah. You know, maybe that amount to build maybe something bigger in a bigger crater, maybe somewhere in the continental United States would work as well. There's lots of old cinder cones that you could put a nice yeah. big uh, radio dish into. But as you said, if 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 we can't maintain can't spend the $80 million to maintain an existing telescope here on earth where people get to breathe air and yeah. eat tropical fruit while they live in paradise working on an amazing observatory. There's no way to get this happening on the moon. We are decades away from that kind of stuff. And so we're going to be decades away from having that science. I mean, of course, once again, the Chinese have the fast telescope, 500 meters, biggest, the world's biggest radio telescope. It doesn't have the radar capacity. I wonder how hard it would be to add that. It's the I same telescope as know. Arecibo, just bigger. Yeah. 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 Um, I I don't know. The amount of power you'd need would be huge. Uh, yeah, I'm looking into this. So let's see. It's like someone's comparing it with radar with with Arecibo. Uh, so Arecibo houses several transmitters. They're too large and heavy for fast small receiver cabin, and so it will not be able to participate in that. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <sighs> let's see. More questions. We've got another five minutes. Zachary Perry asks, when the Earth gets enveloped by the sun, will Titan be the best candidate for sustaining future life in the solar system? So the thing is, as the sun gets bigger, it's also undergoing mass loss. As the sun loses mass, the orbits of the planets move outward. As the sun gets bigger, it becomes more luminous, but the temperature that the light comes out at drops. So this becomes a very complicated multivariable problem very quickly. Um, my back of the head calculation um, is that Titan will have migrated out too far and will be way the heck too cold. And that the majority red light will have an even harder time passing through the methane to the surface. Um, at the same time, Mars will have also migrated outwards and should be safe, we think. How about Europa? I think Europa is your spot. Because Gan- Jupiter's close. I'd say Ganymede, Ganymede because yeah, because yeah. it's got a magnetosphere. Are nice. It has a magnetosphere. It's the only other place in the solar system with a planetary magnetosphere. Yeah. So Titan's not your place. Ganymede. That's the future home of humanity. Um, There's another season of Expanse coming out, speaking of Ganymede. Yeah. Are you all caught up? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Um, Zachary Perry asks, how important will biomining be for establishing a colony on the moon or Mars? Do you have any idea what he's talking about? No. Okay. Um, so essentially people have been figuring out ways to use, uh, bacteria to be able to mine material to essentially extract useful minerals out of different kinds of rocks and chemicals. Uh, I mean, maybe, I mean, there's lots of different ways to get stuff out of rock and, and they're, they're, I mean, here on earth, they're trying to figure out biomining as a, as a way to compare it just in terms of using other more traditional methods. And if that works here on Earth, it might be very effective on on the moon as well. So Veronica is asking, are we going to do a geek shopping episode this year? I don't think we have one scheduled. Mm -mm. Um, Are you doing anything over on Universe Mm -mm. today? We're going to start doing some reviews over on Daily Space. Yeah, Nancy will usually do an an episode um, or an article about about some cool uh, geek ideas. So... I'm going to tentatively say we probably will. In fact, now I'll just ask her and I'm sure she'll say yes. Okay. So. And we're going to put some stuff together for community coffee over on Cosmo Quest. Yeah. I mean, I guess tell us if that's the thing you want us to do. I I mean, I feel like we'll just say the same things we do every year. Right. Binoculars. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I can't think of anything new. And there's nothing really new since last year because everyone. Yeah. 2020 that's yeah. all i've got an ev scope that yeah nice. that's true those yeah. are cute if you want to spend four thousand dollars you can get somebody a, a really cool robotic telescope um they have them at opt yeah um one more minute andrew planet asked uh oh where'd it go where'd it go there you go. Do hypervelocity black holes exist? And would we be able to tell if they were heading this way? They probably exist. Yeah. And we'd only be able to tell if they're headed this way if they somehow have materials still clinging to them that they are uh, doing stuff to so that it's releasing x-rays or something. There you go. So mostly they're just dangerous things flying through the universe. And... And although that sounds terrifying, just remember that the Earth and the, the solar system has been here for four and a half billion years, and there's no evidence that a black hole has ever come close. So don't worry about it. It's just like you'd be really unlucky for it to happen. All right, we've reached the end of our episode. So uh, thank you, everybody, for watching us today. Thank you to all of the moderators, everybody in the comments, both on YouTube and on Twitch. We really appreciate this. Have a good time. Thank you, Pamela, for bringing the knowledge. 
and we will see all of you next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Stay safe.